Hello, I'm Dr. Preeti Malani, JAMA Associate Editor. I'm also the Chief Health Officer at the University of Michigan and a Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. Today I'm talking with two guests who are longtime colleagues about the recently identified Omicron SARS-CoV-2 variant and how its unique structure separates it from previous variants of concern seen during the COVID-19 pandemic and the many implications for both U.S. and global health. The first is Dr. Carlos Del Rio, a distinguished professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Emory University School of Medicine and professor of epidemiology and global health at the Rollins School of Public Health. He's also a JAMA editorial board member. Welcome, Carlos. Happy to be with you. I'm also joined by Dr. Adam Loring, an associate professor at the University of Michigan in the Division of Infectious Diseases and also the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. Dr. Loring is a physician scientist whose research focuses on the evolution of RNA viruses, and he is, like myself and Dr. Del Rio, a practicing infectious disease doctor. Welcome, Adam. Thanks for having me. And thank you both for joining this conversation. I know it's been an exceptionally busy time. So as viruses spread, they constantly change their genetic code, which results in mutations. Sometimes these mutations change the biology of the virus. And this is something that was talked about as a possibility for SARS-CoV-2 very early on. And I remember Adam talking with you especially about this being a possibility. And what's been observed for the past year is that certain mutations in the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 may make the virus more transmissible or affect how well vaccines protect people. And the CDC uses a classification system designating some variants as variants of concern. And this began with alpha and, of course, most recently, delta. And there's also a designation of variants of high consequence, which thankfully we have not seen so far. And Omicron was designated as a variant of concern within just a few days of being identified. So, Adam, this is stuff that you think about a lot. And there's been a lot of talk about this variant, in particular, the large number of mutations. And as someone who is really deeply, deeply immersed in the evolution of RNA viruses, and, and this virus in particular. Let's talk mutations and what this means. What clues do the mutations tell us so far? In terms of Omicron, I think the, the big thing that struck everyone at the get-go were the sheer number of mutations in the spike protein. As you mentioned, uh, spike is a key protein for the virus. It allows it to attach to cells. Uh, mutations affect how well it spreads. Um, and that's not to the exclusion of mutations outside of spike, which are also important for transmissibility and potentially severity. But there's so many in spike, I think 35 or so in Omicron. And of course, spike is also important uh, as a target for our monoclonal antibodies and also for uh, the vaccines. And so I think that raised alarm bells uh, appropriately and why we're all paying attention to it this week. So one of the things that's being discussed is the origins, you know, where and how. And uh, of course, this was sequenced in South Africa, and it's yet unknown where and how it emerged. But one of the things being discussed is whether the, this variant emerged in someone whose immune system is otherwise not normal. And uh, Adam or Carlos, uh, can you comment on that? Well, let me start first by stating that, you know, as long as there's transmission, Viruses replicate and they'll mutate. And as Adam will tell you, RNA viruses are particularly prone to mutate. So we learn, you know, we learned this in HIV a long time ago. The way to stop mutations is to is to stop viral replication, right? If you control viral replication, the virus doesn't mutate. So I think we will continue to see mutations in this virus happen as long as we have a pandemic, as long as we have transmission. And again, emphasizes the importance of trying to control transmission in order to decrease the mutations. And we've seen, you know, Delta emerge in India, and we've seen you know, gamma emerge in Brazil, and we've seen now Delta, suppose, I mean, Omicron supposedly emerge in, in South Africa. Uh, what, what, one of the theories is that a person with HIV and severe immune suppression who was infected for a prolonged period of time was where maybe over 300 days is where this virus then evolved and the evolution of the virus happened. Because again, as you're unable to clear the virus, the virus is multiplying, it's continuously mutating and changing in that environment. And that that itself could have led to to this, the, the, this variant being being developed. But, you know, we have a lot of immunosuppressed patients throughout the world. We have them with HIV. We have, you know, patients with, with uh, 
uh, transplant recipients. We have people that we immunosuppress with some of the drugs we have. So again, emphasizes the importance of not only vaccinating immunosuppressed individuals, but also continuing NPIs for immunosuppressed individuals. Because whenever I have an immunosuppressed patient infected with, H- with, with, with SARS-CoV-2, I always worry about, oh my God, is this somebody who's going to not be able to clear the, the virus and yet lead to another variant? I'll, I'll echo that, uh, what uh, Carlos said. I, th- I think the, 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 to me, looking at it, as I indicated, with so many mutations in Spike, it's clear, that, it's clear that there's been a lot of selection, a lot of evolution and adaptation happening there uh, in that protein. And, and so I think the two leading hypotheses are this immunocompromised host uh, idea, because with prolonged infection, you can get enough time for that selection to happen. And mutations to accumulate. The other one, which receives has received less attention, is the possibility of what's called a reverse zoonosis, so that SARS-CoV-2 uh, has you know gone into other animals uh, over time, and that you know it would evolve differently in, a, in an animal host than it will in a person, and then um, you know could then potentially enter back into the human population as a very different virus. Um, right now, we have no we don't know uh, which of those is more likely, but we do know that there's been a lot of evolution happening uh, in Omicron, um, and that, and I think those are the two major theories. And I'll just, you know, I've always been pushed back gently on immunocompromised host uh, uh, origin theories for these variants, not scientifically always, but because I, I do worry about stigmatizing uh, these patients. And so I think we have to be very careful um, in talking about uh, variants in these hosts and what to do about it because it's a really complicated issue. But I think Adam, what you what 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 clearly we understand from this variant is that it's not like it was one strain that through subsequent transmissions right. to other individuals accumulated right. mutations. Yep. It's pretty yeah, clear exactly. that all these mutations occurred in the in the, in the same individual, or in the same yeah, host, or at least or at least the vast majority right. of them. Yes, very much so. Yes, very much. It's 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 been evolving in some sort of environment for some time, and it's not being. It wasn't interrupted by transmission um, as much as uh, we, you know, have been seeing with SARS-CoV-2. And, and when you look at the phylogenetic trees, I mean, it's really out there. I mean, this yeah. is really a very separate branch from from many of the other variants we've seen in the past. Mm-hmm. Carlos, you live in Atlanta. You know, you're you're and do a lot of different things. You're an infectious disease doctor. You're also a public health and global health expert, and you work down the street from the CDC, literally walking distance. Uh, what's happening right now? What data are being collected? What's going to happen to inform what happens next in the public health arena in the really coming days, weeks, and months? Well, I think I think there's several things that are happening. Number one, I think we need not forget that there's still an ongoing severe pandemic of SARS-CoV-2 with Delta here in this country. We don't need Omicron. I mean, you in Michigan are, are having our hospitals uh, overwhelmed, and we will have a significant epidemic there. You have it also in Minnesota and in, in in many other places. So I think we need not to forget that the pandemic has not ended. So we still need to control the pandemic locally. And the fact that, you know, there's still many, many Americans who have not been immunized continues to be a concern and something that we need to worry about. From a public health standpoint, I think the the coronavirus task force and the CDC are focusing on, on several things. Number one, uh, CDC has now authorized boosters for anybody over the age of 18. And I think the first recommendation is let's try to boost people as much as we can. And, you know, only about 20% of Americans who've been vaccinated have been boosted. So we got to get more of our patients, our families, our friends, ourselves boosted if we haven't. Uh, number two is I think CDC needs to do, uh, needs to scale up testing and needs to scale up uh, genomic testing and genomic sequencing. You know, normally about five to 7% of isolates get sequenced uh, nationwide, and we need to scale that up quite a bit. The other thing is we need to also establish very good ways to look at, at, at travelers. And rather than saying, oh, we're closing our borders and we're you know, shutting down flights, what we need to do is we need to continue having flights, but we need to be sure that several things are happening. Number one, the US is requiring a, 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 a SARS-CoV-2 negative test before 72 hours before you board. From the, the countries that have Omicron, they may actually move that to closer, maybe to 24 hours before departure. Number two, they're talking about doing a test after you arrive in this country, maybe two to three, two to three days after you arrive, and, and following people that arrive from those countries carefully. But I think, again, we need to really scale up testing. We're not doing enough testing. We've never done enough testing in our country. 
and we have to do genomic surveillance, and we need to push vaccinations. Those are the, the public sales strategies that we know work, and we need to continue to do. Adam, can you add to that, too, um, you know, at the, at the sort of virologic level, what are some of the things that would might be happening right now in labs? Well, I think uh, just in my discussions with folks over the last few days, uh, since coming back from the Thanksgiving break, there's a lot of discussion on how to shift uh, testing programs, at, for example, at our health system, um, to uh, certain uh, platforms that might provide an early alert to if Omicron's there. Certain, you know, certain uh, PCR tests have a signature that can be used for screening uh, uh, of, of the Omicron variant and prioritizing uh, certain kinds of tests or, or prioritizing for sequencing uh, individuals with a recent travel history uh, to try to leverage uh, the capacity uh, to where we think we would most likely, you know, be able to find Omicron and react uh, in a timely manner. So that, that that's what I've I've been hearing in conversations, you know, around here. You know, the, the only thing I would add to that, Adam, is that in many of the cases of Omicron in many European countries, there was no connection to travel, right? So we're just going to rely, I think the travel history, we go back to the beginning of the pandemic. It was not travel to China. We found it in individuals because it was already here. I think you may make a good point. If you're using the TACMAN PCR, there'll be this, this famous, you know, S, SG gene uh, target failure that is pretty much a signature. And as a colleague in South Africa told me, you know, you could see the three spikes, but the, the S gene is, is totally flat. You, it's really a very clear indication. And that's how this was first picked up. It was they were seeing this sort of a large number of those S gene target failures. The problem is a lot of the testing that we do in our hospitals doesn't have that problem. It actually does not detect that. So you, you're absolutely right. You need to change your, your approach to testing. The other thing that I like to remind people is from all the indications we have, the rapid test still pick up this variant very well because, again, most of the mutations are in spike, and spike is not the antigen in the rapid test. So it's really important, again, to make rapid tests available. And I think, you know, in our country, rapid tests are still uh, very expensive and, and not available for the greater majority of the population. So one of the other things that the government needs to do and CDC needs to do is really subsidize rapid testing so people can actually test themselves very actively. I agree with you, Carlos, on that. And you know, this is something that, that we can do better. And, you know, Adam, your lab has been very, very busy uh, for the past uh, couple of years. I mean, it's been busy always, but you're doing a lot of sequencing. Can you just explain what's involved with that and why it's hard to do a lot of sequencing quickly? Sure. I, I think the the it's easy to say we need to do more sequencing. It's harder to do more sequencing. Um, I think I, I will say that I think the U.S. has done a fantastic job since early 2021. We're up to about four to five percent. Um, by comparison, the U.K., which is the gold standard, is around 10 to 15 percent um, in terms of cases sequenced. The, the, the biggest challenge we found of late is just getting the viruses, getting this, getting those samples. Um, we've been able to increase capacity, as many labs have over the last year uh, in terms of sequencing. Uh, and we can generally turn around sequencing two to three, two to three days um, from when it arrives uh, in my lab to actually having the complete data uploaded. Uh, and that takes a lot of work and coordination, but we kind of got that down. The hard part is getting those samples. Um, you know, the rapid tests are fantastic. Uh, the point of care tests that are used in many emergency departments are fantastic um, and they're important. Um, but those samples are not captured for sequencing. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when, when people look at the number of cases, easily 50% of those samples, you're not going to be able to sequence because they're just not suitable for sequencing. And then beyond that, it takes a lot of effort, you know, to just get the samples from the clinical micro lab or, or whatnot um, in a timely manner uh, to a sequencing lab. And, and there's just a lot of logistics involved in doing that. And um, that, that's for us is the biggest challenge. Uh, but then, yeah, it takes about a day or, or so to prepare uh, the, the sample for sequencing and then another day uh, to actually put it on the sequencer, get the data, analyze it, um, and, and quality check everything. So it's, 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 it's a process. We've gotten better at it. And I, I know many of my colleagues have, you know, everyone's nipping around the edges and improving things all the time um, to get this uh, to working well. And, uh, you know, I... I, 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 have, I have nothing but uh, amazement at what the U.S. has done since January. Obviously, we were behind other countries uh, for some time, but I think there's been a, a great re uh, effort uh, in 2021. 
The other thing I would say when you when you said, Adam, about getting samples, I know a lot of scientists, uh, speaking to my colleagues here at the Emory Vaccine Center, that are, are trying to find uh, samples, are trying to get uh, isolates of Omicron, right? Because what a lot of the questions that we have, a lot of what's happening in research laboratories uh, right now is trying to understand, indeed, in actual samples, do the neutralizing antibodies work? Do the vaccine, uh, do, do I have serum from vaccinated patients? Do they neutralize the virus, et cetera, et cetera? So, so a lot of the research that is happening right now in the laboratory is really trying to understand really what is the significance of this virus? What is, you know, we still don't know the, the, the are not of this virus. We still don't know if it's more transmissible, or less transmissible. We still don't know if it's, you know, more resistant um, or less susceptible to monoclonal antibodies and to neutralizing antibodies from vaccines or not. We don't know much about the clinical spectrum. So there's a lot of questions that we don't know. Some of them will be answered in the clinic, but a lot of them are going to be answered in the laboratory. And I would caution that, you know, uh, we're hearing all sorts of things. I mean, yesterday you saw the the CEO of, of Moderna saying our vaccines don't work against this virus. And I didn't see any data to back him up on him saying that. But at the same time, then I heard, you know, physicians from from uh, colleagues from Israel saying people that have been boosted are doing fine. And they don't they're not they even if they get infected, they have a very mild disease with Omicron. So we need data. And I think what we need really is to stop sort of rumors. And we really need data that we can look at and that we can actually understand. Agree wholeheartedly, Carlos. So let's shift a bit to therapeutics. Uh, this is something that has uh, changed relatively quickly, and we've gotten better at supportive treatment and supportive care in the hospital. Uh, and again, the focus with therapeutics has been really to prevent hospitalizations. And, and I'm thinking about an monoclonal antibodies, which we just mentioned briefly. And these are, of course, designed to mimic the body's natural immune response. And they've been available for patients who are at high risk for progression to severe disease. And these, again, they specifically target the spike protein. So Adam, how does Omicron affect the monoclonal antibody strategy? And as you know, we're, we're doing a lot of this out of Michigan medicine. Yeah. Right. I mean, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the monoclonals here at, at our system. And of course, you know, you've seen the same emails I have with the surge in Michigan. There's, you know, there's not enough supply. Um, it's been really hard. Um, so that I think just emphasizes we're dealing with Delta now and, you know, it's good to think about Omicron, but uh, we've got problems to solve right now. Uh, in terms of uh, the monoclonals uh, and Omicron, I think we'll, I suspect we'll have data, I would imagine in a week or so. I imagine right now that, you know, the various companies or labs are testing uh, the available monoclonals uh, to see. We do have some clues based on the mutations uh, that are in Omicron. Uh, because there's, there are many within the, the, the targeted epitopes of these monoclonals. Uh, and it appears that, you know, you know some of them are going to, you know, probably have a, a, a loss of significant activity uh, based on those mutations. Now, it's hard to know because you don't know how these mutations interact together. Uh, they, they may not be the sum of their parts. Uh, and so we'll have to wait for that data for a week. But I suspect we will see that, uh, you know, some of the monoclonals might not work as well against Omicron, and then, uh, but that some of them will probably be just fine based on what we know about the epitopes and the mutations, but we're just going to have to see, um, you know, what develops over the next week as people get the data. You know, I think one of the most interesting things happening in, in monoclonals is actually the AstraZeneca monoclonal that has a very long half-life, right? Six to 12 months. And it'll be very interesting to see how that develops. It's still being in clinical trials but how it res re responds not only against Omicron, but against Delta, but how much we can use it for, for prevention. And again, I go back to our immunosuppressed patients. If they cannot respond to a vaccine, can we give them monoclonal every six to 12 months and prevent them from getting infected? But, you know, at the end of the day, what I worry about, pretty go back to global health, is monoclonals, uh, we're struggling to get them here. They're totally unavailable in, in the great majority of the, of the world. And it's not a therapy that we can scale up in any significant way. And most of the world you know, monoclonals is like talking about, you know, going to the moon. It simply doesn't happen. We need to find uh, other therapies. And I think the development of oral antivirals, I think, is exciting. Uh, you know, the FDA advisory committee uh, yesterday, in a very interesting discussion, voted to to approve uh, 13 to 10, the, the uh, molnupiravir, the Merck monoclonal that I'll say, you know, was developed by some of my colleagues here at Emory. Uh, but I have nothing to do with it, so I can talk about it. I, I've yet to see the data. I'm looking forward to see the paper published. We can actually look at the data. What we've seen in press releases is, you know, a decrease from the initial report to what appears to be maybe a 30 percent 
uh, efficacy, which is not not great, but it, I guess it's better than nothing. You know, it made me, made me think about the early days of HIV when we approved ACT. You know, it didn't do much, but it still got approval and it still was useful as, as one of the antivirals. Uh, but other antivirals are going to appear, and I'm, I'm looking forward to see more because what we really need is oral antivirals that we can, we can scale up globally to treat people with, with, with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Yeah, no, I think that it's, um, I'm glad you mentioned that. And as you know, you can't just drive up to like a local pharmacy and pick up monoclonal antibodies. You know, it requires specialized access, infusion, monitoring. And, you know, in theory, if you have something that can be given early, could give at the point of care of testing, uh, that does incrementally reduce your risk of hospitalization and death from COVID. It could be something that, that would change things a lot. But lots of questions, and you know, as you know, Carlos, uh, there's a similar pill from Pfizer that's going to be discussed, and you know, likely in the coming weeks, these these oral antivirals will become available. But again, they don't replace vaccination, so um, it's just you know one more tool in our toolbox. But it would be it would be interesting. You know, we've talked a lot about this this pills decreasing your risk of of progression to hospitalization and death. But but we also need to look at the data. Are they decreasing transmission, right? Are they decreasing the the the, the viral load and the nasal secretions, and therefore decreasing transmission? Because if you get only a thirty percent decrease in hospitalization, but you get a sixty percent decrease in transmission, I still think it's very valuable to use a drug like this, you know, in the setting of de- de- decreasing transmission within the community. Very no different than what we do with with oseltamivir for influenza, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think again, the oral antivirals they do have more potential for global use. But again, I, I think we're, we're a long way there. You know, we're, we're a long way from equity. So I want to talk about vaccines. These They've now been available for almost a year. It's, it's hard to believe. I know that uh, probably the three of us were got our first dose. We were very, very lucky to get our first doses in December. Um, I feel like that was a, that, that's a day that, that stays with me. Uh, about 8 billion doses plus now given worldwide. Um, Adam, let's let's talk about vaccine effectiveness. And you know, this is something you've done studies for years around vaccine effectiveness for flu. Uh, and something that you've taught me, and something I've said, I've kind of I, I should attribute it to you because I say it a lot, is that vaccination is not a therapeutic intervention for the person. It's really about protecting everyone else. And I also think a lot about illness versus infection because we're clearly not preventing infections. Uh, in everyone, but we are preventing illness in a lot of people. But, you know, as we're thinking about Omicron, and as you point out, you know, we're still thinking about Delta. What are you thinking about vaccine effectiveness? What are what are the things you're going to pay attention to? Right. I think, uh, you know, with Omicron, obviously it's way too early, and I'm not going to listen to anything about Omicron vaccine effectiveness for several weeks or months, because as, as you know, it takes a while to do these studies well, um, and it takes a careful look at the data and controlling uh, for all sorts of bias and confounders in an observational study. So, you know, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot early on about how many people were vaccinated who got Omicron and and, and such, but it's going to take a while to figure out. I mean, we're still learning about Delta uh, and, and vaccine effectiveness. Uh, you know, that said, with the usual caveats, I will say I suspect that with Omicron, uh, given its mutations, um, that we will see that, you know, circulating antibodies won't you know, probably won't neutralize it as well as kind of the original SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and I suspect that data will come out in a week or so. Um, uh, that's just, that's pure prediction and speculation. Um, but just looking at the mutations, I, I, I would expect that. And I wouldn't be surprised if there might be some erosion uh, in vaccine effectiveness against infection. I, I'm more much more optimistic that uh, VE will be uh, maintained against more severe disease. Um, and a lot's based on, you know, just our recent experience with Delta. Um, uh, we've been privileged to work with the CDC uh, IV network on their VE studies, and they just had a paper in, in JAMA uh, a couple weeks ago um, looking at VE. Um, and it's been preserved, uh, you know, for months against hospitalization and other severe outcomes um, and against variants as well, um, at least in that study. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see um, similarities with Omicron, but, you know, it's going to take a while to kind of sort out VE and all these different scenarios, how it plays out in different populations, different regimens, different vaccines, different outcomes. Um, there's going to be a lot of work to be done. 
uh, but it, it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, it's not it's not just one thing. It's different vaccines, as you know. It's yeah. boosted, not boosted. It's it's the host too. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, which gets me, you know, Carlos. Let's let's talk about one of the harder questions, and this is really a U.S. based question. Because so much of the population remains unvaccinated. And I'll I'll share a couple of anecdotes. I actually just finished rounding, and as as you know, uh, we're experiencing a, a very large surge uh, right right now in Michigan. I was rounding the last couple of weeks. At, uh, at Michigan Medicine. And, you know, I saw a lot of patients with severe COVID, almost all of whom were unvaccinated. Some were very, very vulnerable, you know, organ transplants, very advanced age, severe lung disease. And, you know, I have to say um, earlier in the year, I would ask and really push around these issues and have more conversations. And I have to say, I've gotten a bit discouraged. And, you know, I'm looking to both of you and to Carlos. I'll start with you. Is what can what can clinicians really do to help move individuals to help provide good information? It, you know, it really feels like my own efforts have moved now toward trying to get people boosted who are already vaccinated, but we need to get first doses in people. Well, you know, I I, I said early on when boosting was first done, I kept on telling people that the boosting I need is for everybody else to get vaccinated because that really is what we need. We need we have to increase our vaccination. And you're absolutely right. Uh, starting a vaccination series has really flattened in our country and we're seeing an uptake on, on the boosting, but we have a population that has not been vaccinated. I think they are comprised of, of different populations. I think the first thing is we need to realize that is not one population, right? You have all the way from people that, uh, you know, are anti-vaxxers and are, are not going to get a vaccine no matter what. Uh, there, there may be five, seven percent of the population, but then you have a large number of individuals that I think are still in the hesitant stage, in the wait and see. A lot of them have been saying things like, well, you know, I want more experience. I want more data. Uh, I need to understand more about these vaccines. I'll, I'll, I'll take them once they've been approved. Well, I remind people that, that the Pfizer vaccine for people over the age of 18 now has full FDA you know, approval. It's a BLA drug, so it's no longer under an EUA. So if you don't want an EUA vaccine and you're over 18, you can get the Pfizer vaccine. That's not an, a vaccine under the EUA. So sometimes I remind that to people. If they say to me, well, I don't want to get something that is still under an EUA, I remind them, well, guess what? This one is no longer on the, in the EUA. And many people look at you like they're surprised. They didn't know that. The other thing is, is I think there's a lot of people out there not getting vaccinated because not a lack of information but of excess of misinformation. And therefore, combating misinformation, I think, is critically important. We have to talk about the things that, you know, young people, many young people, this, this myth going around about the vaccines impact your fertility, for example, is a big one that I hear in young individuals that don't want to get vaccinated. Uh, are you hear about people that say, you know, it changes your DNA. Even today, I had an email from somebody said, you know, uh, send me a clip and something that they saw on Facebook saying that it changes your DNA. So we have to really tackle misinformation because misinformation is really driving a lot of people not to get vaccinated. And then we have to use opportunities like Omicron. I mean, I think during Delta, you're absolutely right. I would see people in the hospital very sick who weren't vaccinated, but I was able to talk to them and say, okay, can you please now talk to your family who is also not vaccinated? Maybe tell them it's time to get your vaccine. And you frequently would see that. So have that opportunity, use that moment. And I, I'm hoping that Omicron in the midst of all this conversation, is yet another opportunity to tell people, okay, you've been waiting for a vaccine, now is the time to take it. I mean, when people say, what can I do about Omicron? I said, get vaccinated. And if you've been vaccinated, get boosted. So I think we have to keep the conversation going, but I understand what you're saying. I mean, it's not, you know, so the, the, the low-hanging fruit has been taken. Right now is really the hard, the hard to get population. And then we also have to remember that, you know, mistrust continues to exist. I was talking to colleagues in South Africa. You know, South Africa has plenty of vaccines. They don't have a problem with having access to vaccines right now, but only 28 to 30 percent of the population is vaccinated. But a large percent of their population is not vaccinated. But then you go into history, right? They have racism. They have apartheid. They have a lot of the same reasons for vaccine hesitancy that we see in our minority populations in this country. So we need to understand that, you know, mistrust uh, of, of, of things like the medical establishment and something developed by white individuals is not just a U.S. phenomenon. You'll see that globally. And in South Africa, they're clearly seeing that. So I think we also need to do more research and, and put more efforts in really trying to see how do we address vaccine hesitancy, period. Yeah, thank you for, for pointing that out. And, and again, I, I, I love that you're, you always bring us back to the, the global health piece. And again, it's, it's been interesting for me, you know, just 
again, anecdotes where patients who I've followed for years, you know, when we have a long discussion in clinic, um, it, they at least leave saying, okay, I'll think about it because they do end up, you know, they do have trust in me. And I, I try to leverage that, but it, you know, it, it does become a bit exhausting. And the, the misinformation, it's, it's really challenging to get at it. You know, when, when people talk about, well, someone was diagnosed with cancer after getting vaccinated, it, it's very hard to, to sometimes uh, cha- change that perception. So I, I guess we, we still have wor- work to do. And I know our audience here includes a lot of frontline clinicians. So I guess keep at it, keep having those conversations. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would also say that we have to also get held our politicians accountable. There has been many politicians that have actively spread misinformation and have fueled it. And if they haven't fueled it, at least they haven't counteracted. And we really have to hold people accountable and say, you know, we really need as a nation to come together. This is not a partisan issue. This is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. This is a, a human issue. And we all need to come together to end this virus. And I think, you know, what I would see probably to me the most difficult thing in this pandemic is how it has divided us as opposed to united us. Uh, you know, one of the things that was that has been wonderful in working with HIV is how we have become, you know, work, working together has been the answer. And we've all come together. And I see, you know, for example, in HIV, you know, PEPFAR has always had bipartisan support. Ryan White has always had bipartisan support. So when we come together, we can achieve great things. And I think we need to also in COVID achieve, you know, get there and try to understand that this is not an issue of, of partisanship. This is really an issue of, of health and national security. Yeah, thank you. And I, I tend to talk a lot about economics and academics and that if you get sick, you're going to miss school, you're going to miss work, you know, that these are these are big issues. It's not just a, an inconvenience. Uh, but I think we have lots of work to do and, and uh, you know, hopefully... Hopefully we will make progress in this regard because I think at the beginning of the pandemic we were all in this together and you know somehow you know, the last couple of years have been difficult. Uh, so Adam, I feel like we should touch base on flu a bit. You know, last year we talked a lot about the twindemic and you know luckily there there wasn't a lot of flu. You know, partly because people were home, they weren't in school, they weren't working, they were wearing masks. You know, this year we're expecting more flu, lots of flu potentially. Uh, and and uh, again, this was your work long before COVID. I'd love to get your thoughts and, you know, maybe if you have a prediction or if you've learned anything uh, recently that might help us get through a tough flu season. Uh, well, I think the twindemic is here. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, you know, our experience here at the University of Michigan, uh, it's been reported, we had a, a, you know, significant, you know, flu outbreak here uh, that's waned, but ongoing. Uh, you know, over November. So uh, there's a lot of flu out there. There's a lot of virus period out there. Uh, I think so that is going to, uh, I think, tax our health system in a uh, perhaps predictable, perhaps unpredictable way uh, in terms of what it's going to do to have both these viruses circulating, uh, causing illnesses, disrupting uh, daily life. Uh, In terms of uh, what to expect, with flu in particular. So what we've had uh, here thus far uh, in Michigan has been H3N2. Um, and uh, we've, uh, through this outbreak, we've learned about the virus that's that's uh, circulating. And so it is uh, a little bit different uh, from what's in the vaccine. Um, it's But it's more similar to what's in the Southern Hemisphere vaccine um, that uh, will be rolled out. So it's slightly different from what's in the Northern Hemisphere vaccine. Uh, but more similar to what's in the Southern Hemisphere vaccine uh, for the H3N2 component. Of course, there's multiple components in the flu vaccine. Um, And what uh, 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 folks are working on now is understanding what that means uh, in terms of disease severity, uh, in terms of vaccine effectiveness. And just as we were talking with Omicron, uh, figuring out these sorts of things takes a lot of time and very careful study. And that's where a lot of people are putting efforts right now at the same time that the same people are all working on COVID. Um, so it's it's a busy time. And I think that just highlights how challenging it is uh, to deal with both of these viruses at once. And so I think that's going to be the story of the next few months across the U.S. But I would I would just add, uh, Adam, uh, that from a you know practicing clinician perspective, the best advice we need to tell everybody is to get their flu shot. And we have to also remind people that continuing mask wearing is not a bad idea. The reason we were able to control flu last year is because we applied 
non-pharmacological interventions like mask wearing. So good opportunity. If I go to the grocery store, if I'm going to crowded, crowded settings, if I get in the subway, I'm still wearing my mask because the reality is, is that it is a good way to prevent respiratory viruses like influenza. A hundred, hundred percent, thousand percent. Uh, I think the lessons now are uh, for COVID, for Delta, for Omicron, for flu, get vaccinated, wear a mask, you know, practice these, you know, uh, interventions that we know work. I mean, we can focus and worry about what's coming down the pike, uh, but we have the tools. We just need to do a better job of using them. So we're recording this on December 1st. And as we're recording, we just got an alert that the CDC has indeed identified the first case of Omicron in the United States. And again, this is not a surprise. This is something that we expected to see. But Adam, Carlos, any uh, early reactions? Well, I'm not surprised. If you look, you're going to find it. We're all interconnected. And I think what we learn is that these cases are already here. Again, emphasizes why travel bans make no sense. Because by the time you do the travel bans, you know, the cat is out of the bag. And we've seen this over and over. And we need to really do other things. And travel bans don't do any anything necessary. And I think it's a bad reaction. It was a, a bad response during the Trump administration. And I said that. And it's a bad response during the Biden administration. I think we need to call it as it is. I think everyone, you know, suspected this was going to happen. Um, and so I think, you know, now now we know it's here. We've had the, the news reports. And so now it's time to keep up the work. So something I say a lot is that COVID is not the only risk to our health. And I, you know, this has clearly been a very, very difficult time for everyone for different reasons. But I think particularly anyone who's a caregiver, essential workers, of course, healthcare workers, especially our nurses and support staff, but really everyone. And, you know, I just want to ask each of you what, you know, you've been very immersed, very, very busy throughout the pandemic. What are you doing to take care of yourself? Adam? It's it's hard. I mean, because you you know, I think I think uh, you know most of us in the in the you know, in the medical community and probably a lot of your listeners feel stretched all the time and are used to working hard and uh, used to trying to figure out uh, that balance. And um, you know, I I forced myself uh, over Thanksgiving to take time uh, take time off and not and try to disengage as much as I could uh, to spend time with my family. And I try to do that on weekends as best I can. Um, you know, while keeping up with the pace during the week. So I think that that's how I try to do it. But it's not to say it's easy. I, I struggle with it, um, just as many people do. Carlos? You know, I, I would say that the things I, I do is I try to take a long walk every day uh, and not take my, my, my cell phone with me so I can really, you know, take a long walk and, and not be distracted. Uh, number two, I, I like listening to music. Uh, it's, it's relaxing. Uh, and then number three, you know, I, I still like, you know, a good meal, a good glass of wine. I mean, something to, to relax and take care of yourself. But but I also will say that besides taking care of ourselves, we need to take care of each other, right? Our colleagues, uh, physicians, uh, APPs, nurses, people we work with in the hospital, everybody's stressed. Today I was hearing about about how there's this epidemic of, of, of just grumpiness and quite frankly, in some places being nasty, right? And we need to to take a, a moment and, and say say thank you, be kind to people. And, and really part of the response to the pandemic needs to be uh, taking care of each other and being nice to each other. Because the reality is, is that this is not gonna end anytime soon. And if we don't do that, then I think we're all gonna suffer personally and professionally. It's a good message, be kind. Yep. What are you looking forward to and what gives you hope? Uh, you know, I think that that science continues to be what's helping us, right? And we need to we need to emphasize that that science, the support for science in this country, needs to continue. And I'm I'm, I'm happy to see the NIH budget increasing. I'm I'm hoping to see who gets appointed as NIH director. Dr. Collins has been terrific. We need really uh, people that that work with with Congress and work with the administration in funding science appropriately, because this is how we get the answers. This is why the US is a leader and we need to continue. And then we need to, to continue working on, on bringing people into our field of infectious disease. I, I really think that it's a great field and we have an opportunity to really use this pandemic to get more people excited about ID and careers in, in public health and microbiology and infectious disease. And, and what gives me, gives me hope is that, you know, I, I'm hoping that that we all will come with lessons out of this pandemic. That probably the most important lesson out of the pandemic is that we need to address health disparities, and we really need to do the things that need to be done to end health disparities. Because the reality is, 
that this pandemic has highlighted what we have all known from HIV and from many other diseases, the enormous health disparities that exist in this country and globally. And I think a commitment to ending health disparities uh, is important. And, you know, this year was, you know, World AIDS Day. The theme was exactly that. It was about ending inequalities. And it was about ending those enormous differences that exist because it's clearly critically important in order to end the pandemics of HIV, of COVID, and of many other diseases that we finally address inequality. So I'm hopeful that, you know, that, that we begin to really take inequality seriously and we stop talking about it and really do something about them. And Adam, what gives you hope for the new year? I, I'll echo a lot of what Carlos said. And I think on a, a more fine grain level, I think with the, we are going to get better uh, at, at controlling COVID. Um, and if you look where we were a year ago, I know it feels with Omicron that everything is started over again, right? We're talking about travel bans. We're talking about, you know, detecting the cases. Uh, but we are so much farther than we were at the beginning of the pandemic uh, a year ago. We've got highly effective vaccines. We've got drugs coming out. Um, even though there's a lot of big problems to solve, uh, we are really uh, uh, have made tremendous improvements. And I think we'll continue to see that over the next year. And it feels a long way away, but I think we're going to get to that magic endemic point that everyone talks about um, sometime, maybe late 2022, but we're going to get there. We're, we're moving in that direction. Um, and, you know, we, we, we've outlined the challenges that lay ahead um, over this discussion, but I think we're moving in the right direction. So I look for more of that in the year ahead. So thanks for this great conversation. Lots of unknowns around Omicron, but lots of reasons for hope. The pandemic is not over, but we have the tools to control it, beginning and ending with vaccination, not just of the U.S., but really the entire world. And as we move forward, it's going to be less about preventing every single case, but preventing severe cases, preventing hospitalizations and deaths, making sure the vulnerable high-risk populations are protected by all of us also being vaccinated. Thank you so much for joining us today.